Okay, let's get started with the actual lab activity for today. So here's from the lab guide, starting with showing the RLC circuit. Now we have a total of six circuits. I've prepared them all, including a resistor that will work for you, so you don't have to worry about the part where it says change the resistor, you know, ask the TA for a new resistor. You're going to set up the circuit like this. Now, the, the circuits are already wired together. For instance, if you take one of these, you have the capacitor goes from here to here, and then this connects, connects to the inductor that comes out here, and then the resistor goes to here. So your connections for power would go from the side of the capacitor that's not connected to the inductor to the end of the resistor. So you're going to connect, connect your power there. The power is coming out of these two ports on the power supply. So here I've connected my power to, this is a different one, but one's going to the capacitor and one is going to the resistor, and I have the inductor in the center. Then you're going to have voltages. Now, let me switch over so you can see what the voltages look like with this setup I have right now. Now I have a total of four voltage measurements here. Yours is set up, well, the lab guide says three, or two voltage measurements, but I saved it so you can have three. We don't have enough probes for each of you to measure four. I'm measuring four voltages. I'm measuring the voltage for the source. Um, that's this one here. That's the voltage for the source. And then I'm measuring the voltage across the inductor, the resistor, and the capacitor separately. Um, that one at least should be the voltage for the source since it's named V0. So when you look at these, each one is sinusoidal. I could change the frequency, or not the frequency, but the scale here on the bottom. This is what we call an oscilloscope display. It has time on the horizontal axis and voltage on the vertical axis. And you have all these sinusoids. You're going to be measuring the peak value for each one of these. So how do you measure the peak value? Well, there's lots of ways. Here's one of the simpler ways. Take <laughs> this job and shove it. Um, take this little measuring tool and just drag it up until it's at the top. And it says 7.960 volts. Take it to the top of the next one. If you want, you can bring it here so it's actually stuck to it. 9.945 volts. Here, 17.62, right? So you're going to measure the peaks of each one of these. Yes? Um, do we need to write down the time for that as well? Nope. Okay, because I was going to say, so it's going to be so strong. Yeah. So you need to measure those voltages. Now, if you look at these voltages, and let me get rid of, uh, actually, nope. If you look at these, of course it's annoying that they're not dark enough and it's hard to see unless you highlight them, but you can see each one when you highlight it. And you're going to start at 300 hertz. The first thing you need to do is find a frequency where the voltage across the inductor and the voltage across the capacitor are similar but not the same. Make them at least one volt different, okay? I don't want them like, well, one was... 9.3, the other one's 9.4, those aren't the same. Make them at least one volt different, but both over four volts. Now I'm going to check to see which one I have measured so I know what I'm looking at. So I have my voltage measurement A is my capacitor. And voltage measurement B is my inductor. So A and B are the two I'm going to compare. And I want to make sure that those are similar but not the same. Now, if you look here, if I look at A, A is a maximum here, right? If I look at B, B is down at its minimum there. So B and A are out of phase. Does that agree with what I just told you? Yes, it does. 
it better. If it doesn't, then we have some weirdness like your teacher was wrong. That should be totally weird, right? Or put another way, it shouldn't happen regularly. It may happen, but not regularly. So if we look at the voltages, I have a voltage of a little over 15 and a voltage of a little over 8. That fits. They're both over 4 and they're different by at least 1 volt. I'd be happy to go on. Now notice I have my source, my power supply is set at 10 volts. The guide says at 6 volts, I just upped it to 10. I saved her, so it will default to 10. Let's see what happens when I, oh, one more thing. Voltage C is the voltage across the resistor. It's a little bit less than 4 volts. I think all of the others are going to be above 4 volts. This one here is a little less. Just go with it. Don't worry about changing the resistor. Let's see what happens when I change the frequency. This is at 700 hertz. Now, you will have the display come up like this showing sine wave, sweep is off, the voltage, and the amplitude. I set that amplitude at 10, and then the frequency. So let's change the, volt, or the frequency instead of 700 hertz, let's go to 300 hertz. What should happen to the voltage across the capacitor when I go to 300 hertz? When I lower the frequency. It went up, right? The voltage across the capacitor is now much larger than the voltage across the inductor at 300. And if I go up to, let's say, 10 or 1,000, then the voltage across the capacitor should dive down, but the voltage across the inductor should go up. So let's see what happens. And indeed, voltage across the capacitor dropped, voltage across the inductor rose. Notice the voltage across the inductor here is bigger than the voltage coming from the power supply. And at 300 hertz, it was the opposite. The voltage across the capacitor was bigger than the voltage across the power supply. And notice that the phases shift a little bit for the total voltage. The total voltage here has its peak. Well, compare the total voltage to the power supply and see their peaks don't come the same place. Peak of the negative peak for the resistor voltage is here, negative peak for the power supply is there. If I change this frequency to like 700 hertz, they're much closer to the, oops, wrong, I was pointing the wrong one. This and this are much closer to having their peaks at the same time. So the time when I have the peak for my resistance voltage shifts because my phase angle is shifting and that reflects the phase angle shift. So what you're going to do, I'm going to change back now to my display with my tablet. <coughs> what you're going to do is set up your circuit and measure very carefully after you have set the frequency. So you adjust the frequency up and down until you have the inductor and the capacitor voltages both above 4 volts, at least 1 volt difference, and then carefully measure, I thought it was, okay, it's on the next slide. I thought it was on that one. Yeah, here we go. Carefully measure the five different voltages specified here. That's the voltage across the resistor, across the inductor. I have L plus R because the inductor is not perfect. It has some resistance to it. Across the capacitor, across the inductor and resistor, and finally, across the entire setup. So you measure those five voltages. After you've measured those five voltages, you're going to spend a lot of time with calculations. So it should go very quickly measuring those five voltages. Then for the calculations, after you've measured those voltages, you're going to make a half-page phasor diagram that's just including the voltages across the inductor and the resistor. That phasor diagram, you notice I put at the top of this page so I wouldn't go to the next page by accident. That phasor diagram is reasonably simple. Start by taking the top half of a page of graph paper. There's a box up here, that little green box with lots of graph paper. The top half of a page and Looking at how big your voltages are across the inductor and the resistor, 
and making your scale, so the inductor voltage, excuse me, the inductor plus resistor voltage will just fit on that half page. Now, you want your scale to also be easy to read. So don't make it 1 centimeter is equal to 1.235 volts. Right? Make it so you have like, okay, so each box, each centimeter is 1 volt, or each box is half a volt, or something like that, so it's going to be easy to, under, to read. But you want to try to use that full half page. And the first thing you do is you take out your, is it a compass or protractor, friends? The thing that, met, that marks arcs. <laughs> okay. You're drawing circles. Okay. So you take out that compass and you make the length of that compass based on the scale that you've written down. So you will have written down something like one box equals 0 0.2 volts. You know, your scale that you're using. You measure out that voltage with the compass and then you make a quarter circle that starts at the origin and goes out that distance of the voltage across the inductor and the resistor. Then on the horizontal axis, you draw a line that has the scaled length for just the voltage across the resistor. Now we have a relationship that the voltage across the inductor plus resistor plus the voltage across the resistor written as phase vectors should equal the voltage I measured across all of those. So this here, the green one, was the measurement I made, one measurement that was across both. The blue one is the measurement just across the resistor, and then the red is the measurement just across the inductor. And so I make, adjust my compass so now its length is just the voltage I measured across the inductor, and from the end of the resistor I put a half circle. And the place where the two circles meet must be the actual way the vector sum, the phase vector sum. And so then I can say, aha, I have now what my voltage across the inductor is, and the horizontal part here is the resistive part, resistive part because you have to change the alignments of the little magnetic domains in there, and then I have the inductive part, the true inductance. Now once you've made those measurements, you will have the voltage across the resistive part of the inductor and the inductive voltage from the inductor. Now you're going to go to calculations and calculate what was the current going through the circuit. Well, from the resistor and the voltage across the resistor, we can get that. So you need to measure your resistance using a multimeter. There's like three of them. Remember, when you measure the resistance, you need to not have a complete circuit. You can just disconnect one side. You don't have to disconnect both sides. But you have to disconnect one side and then measure the resistance of that resistor. And using the actual measured resistance and the voltage that you measure across the resistor, you get the current. From that current, you can calculate what the resistive portion of the inductor is. And you can calculate what the impedance of the inductor and capacitors are from the voltage drop across just the inductive part and the voltage drop across just the capacitive part. Why are you doing these two? Because these allow you to calculate capacitance, oops, wrong one, inductance is equal to XL over omega and capacitance is equal to omega over XC. Uh, no, that ain't right. That should be right. So you can get the inductance and capacitance from those measurements. Now that you have this, now you're going to make the complete phase diagram. The complete phase diagram, which is shown, I think, three pages back now. Come on. 
Don't one too many pages. The complete phase diagram is going to be drawn. I want you to draw it in this order. Put the voltage drop that is the resistive portion of the inductor first, then the inductive portion of the inductor. So I first have the total voltage drop across the inductor, then the voltage drop across the resistor, and finally the voltage drop across the capacitor. The reason I want it in that order is so each line is distinctly separate from the one before it and the one after it. This one here, again, you'll need to scale. You'll use a different scale because it goes farther. Measure the total voltage and measure the phase angle. So from this, you will make those measurements of the total voltage and the phase angle. And then you're going to compare those voltages, at the total voltage and the phase angle, with some theory. So your voltage resistor should be equal to the voltage source cosine um, phase angle. You answer some questions. It's just answering questions. I'm not going to lead you through that. Then the final step is to calculate what frequency, remember we've already calculated the L and C previously, what frequency is going to make XL equals XC? Because it resonates XL is equal to XC. So you calculate that frequency, and then you're going to come back to your circuit and put the frequency at one half of your resonant frequency you calculated. Now be reasonable. If you calculate your resonant frequency was 582 hertz, just round that. Just say that's approximately 600 hertz. And so half of that would be 300 hertz. Two times that would be, or not two times that, uh, one and a half times would be 900 hertz. And so in steps of 30 hertz, you're going to go, or 30 hertz? Nope. Steps of 60 hertz. I did that one wrong. 600 divided by 10 is 60, right? I can do this math all in my head. In steps of 60, you go from 300 to 900. So you do 300, 360, 420, and so on. And at each one, you measure just the voltage across the resistance. That's all you're measuring. So you go through all of those, and then you make a graph that has the voltage across resistance. And the frequency... And you plot what it looks like. And once you plot it, draw a smooth curve to show the best estimate and find where the center is and compare the frequency of that center to the frequency that you calculated the resonant frequency to be. And that's the end of the lab. So the actual measurements is small. It's making those phasor diagrams that is the time-consuming part. Um, <coughs> any questions before we get started? Okay, then let's get started. I will go and grab the computers. Um, we will work. We have one, two, three, four, five, six stations, so we'll work in groups of threes.